everyone. My name is Precious Wayne Ogolaja. We are live at the palace of the Oluwawori, a revered monarch. It's one king, one people, one language, a destination of the Shekiri people, a unique tribe with a vast rich cultural heritage that dates back to more than 500 years. A minority group found in Delta State in the southern region of Nigeria, yet a lifeline of the country Nigeria in terms of her rich natural resources, the oil. From 1480 AD, when she had her first king, a crown prince from the ancient Benin Kingdom, the transitioning of one king to the great beyond has birthed another, initially referred to as the Omoba. The Olu designates all the incoming king, who then proceeds into isolation for a period of three months at a place referred to as Idanike. This is in preparation for the onerous task ahead. Expectations though high, are oftentimes positive as the people look forward to a glorious reign that will largely impact their lives whilst also preserving her age-long tradition. But the big question is, who else is in a better position to give answers to the yearnings of the people, if not the one chosen by the people and the ancestors? I recently had a chat with Omoba Utiyanyurisha Shola Emiko to find out more about his plans and how he intends to meet the expectations of his people. It was quite a beautiful conversation, I must say, but this is how it went down. Your Majesty, on behalf of the Shepherd people, I'd like to especially thank you, first of all, for granting us uh, this opportunity to do this interview. It's an honor, and we really appreciate you for that. Quickly, um, it was a tough one preceding your emergence as the Omoba. It's obvious that people have immense faith in your reign, expectations are high, but can you please share with us what is the first area you will be looking at once you become the king? One thing that is very glaring and staring us in the face is I am dominant by youth, and it's not unique to the Shekiri nationality, it's, it's a nationwide problem. Mm -hmm. Something one has to be very thoughtful of because creating the local economy is is not easy, especially when you are not um, empowered by or supported by the government. Um, and there are certain and to go away from the government to make your your area attractive, you need to attract uh, private private investment. And um, we have suffered in terms of an environment and atmosphere that would ordinarily be attractive to private investors. You know, you don't want to dwell on the past, but the worry crisis did not do well for our reputation. We inadvertently chased them away by our collective actions. The falling trajectory of the Nigerian economy since then further um, is the word decimated our economic climate. Um, and um, obviously, our population increasing, schools churning out mm -hmm. graduates. It's tough. It is very, very tough. It's I, I, I can say it's the thought of it keeps me up at night because I am a young man myself, and the only thing I did was just to be privileged to have been born into what I was born into. Otherwise, I would be no different from the average checking man on the street. It's something that must be addressed because when you have your youth engaged. Economy picks up around them. You know, how the youth and your women engage, they empower them. There is a serious ripple effect to the economy, so we'll be looking at ways as to how we can um, address that. And if I was to come up with a close second, it would be Shekiri as people, we are losing our territory, we are losing our our identity. We are losing our place, our formerly exalted place in society. 
this news. We were fast with this news. And um, we must bring that to the point. Mm-hmm. I think those are those two things that are pressing. And I guess uh, the third one, which actually ties into the first one in a way, is, is education. You know, yes, we have a lot of people who have gone to school and they come out and they are not employed. So that's why I would not call education first because even those who are educated now, they are discouraged that they went to school in the first place. But still, we cannot just walk away and say, okay, since going to school does not necessarily translate into a prosperous life, why waste resources going to school? That's definitely the argument. Mm-hmm. But um, because I, I, I say this casually, that whatever your hustle is, if you are educated, you will be better at that hustle than someone who is not educated. So, where yeah, people may want to argue and say, all those who are going to school, are they employed? Still, education is never wasted. All right, yeah, so talking about education, uh, let's, I think, start from there uh, upwards. Education, we all know, is an essential tool for development anywhere in the world, but sadly, it seems like the young ones in Ishakiri land obviously do not understand how important this is. Because why I say this is several times we hear stories of people uh, who get scholarship opportunities. You see them selling uh, these opportunities off. Maybe it's a hearsay, but let's say that's even the case. What specific measures would you be introducing to actually curb this challenge? Once again, I have not seen the evidence, but I have heard it several times. We use Chevron, for example, you know, they give our young people scholarships, and certain people grab that information. And for whatever reason, they sell it. Mm-hmm. And they sell it to only Chevron people. You know, and even that should be. A red flag that non Shaky people are willing to buy that thing from you because they see the value of it. But somebody who is a Shaky person who should be thinking about where are my nieces, where are my nephews, where are my children, you know, if, if all your children are grown, you know, where is my, my neighbor's children here, you know. But the tendency is to sell and to sell to non Shaky people. Um, like I said, I don't want to talk about it as though I have empirical evidence, but it's, it's, I hear it a lot. And we will definitely look into that as to why the tendency, let me make money. Mm. Let me basically, it's the Esau syndrome. Let me eat my small bowl of porridge now and sell my birthright, which will be something in the future. Let me eat now. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. And unfortunately, that is the mindset of the day. It's not just in education, it's in everything. Nobody wants to think about can I suffer, can I discipline myself? And wait it out five years and wait to see the rewards of this. But instead, it's me, eat it now. And if nothing comes tomorrow, I'm starting today. And we need a real orientation of that approach True, an orientation. Now, we're known for marine, we're known for oil and gas, and uh, we have people going offshore, you know, for the same of pride back in the days. And it seemed like a lot of these youth seem to fall prey because of joblessness. Uh, you talk about employment initially when you started. I would love to ask to complement. Um, that our potential as a people in the oil industry, even though we know that, yes, the oil industry is kind of uh, dwindling as it is right now with uh, global realities. Are there also plans to enhance agribusiness in the kingdom, uh, looking at fishing, for instance, rice farming, poultry, and all of that? Definitely. Um, I know our politicians say it's a lot to agriculture, agriculture, agriculture. And I'm careful just jump on it and say agriculture, agriculture. Yes, agriculture is a very viable alternative. But before we even start talking about agriculture, we have to talk about the attitude of our people. And even as I talk about the attitude of our people, I want to be careful whether we talk about it. Because all of a sudden I have the face of our people. 
I am their number one ambassador. In fact, I am the brand. Mm -hmm. So when I go outside, I'm only going to say good things about us. So if we're bringing agriculture, are our young people ready to do the work? Are they ready? We have vast lands that towns and villages are empty. Nature is reclaiming land. We have solid land. So if we go and we demarcate and we say, fine, we're building a plantation here, you know, we're gonna get foreigners to come and invest in this plantation. Our young people ready to hold their pride and go and work on those farms. Are they ready? So I understand it's the time of social media and everybody wants to look good and put their best pictures out on Facebook and Instagram and living such a good life. And once the camera is off, they're not living good lives. So are they ready to do away with all that superficial projection and go and do things that will yield for them? No matter how seemingly humbling it is, you have to start from there. Not everybody can become an entrepreneur in media today. And there are a lot of people who desire, they aspire to be, you know, and that's great, but mm -hmm. if there is something that you can start with and that will really be, but it just requires a bit of adjustment and humility, I think that's 50% of our problem solved. So we have to consider our land, we have to consider our rivers, we have fish, we have lobsters, we have crabs, which the Western world is dying for. And so if we are able to persuade people to come and okay, bring fishing trawlers in, bring some of them anywhere in South Africa, Europe, or whatever, okay, we're going to put you now, mm -hmm. set up this big. The youth cannot come in there and say, we're going to tax you. You are on that. That attitude, mm -hmm. welcome them. See how you can. Let them teach you how to fish literally. Not sitting there thinking that's what you do. It has already failed if you are coming at it like that. You believe you know how to fish. That's great. But these people have demonstrated they have successful commercial fishing. Calm down. Learn from them. But if you are going there thinking I already know how to do this, you can't tell me how to fish and I'm fish seeds. There's also this issue of Deve, I don't know if you've heard of that as well. Major issue in most of our communities. How do you also intend to address that? It's one thing to speak and say this practice should stop. It's easy to sit here. This is a comfortable environment, this is a comfortable chair. To sit here and say stop that, stop that, stop that. Like mm hard. -hmm. And so these young people feel well. We are not criminals. We are not stealing. We are not committing fraud. This is our community. These oil companies and tank farm owners are making so much money on our land and they are not helping us, so we must tax them. I get it. I understand. Mm. But the tendency is to exploit that and you discourage people from even coming. So if you feel you must be aggressive in getting things from these communities, there they are, we call it. It can be better arranged. I don't have the answers now. But if you're acting as a gatekeeper, harassing these people, I have heard and I have seen, let me use the example of our John neighbors, who I'm told are not really aggressive with this, they are Deve. And that is why their riverine areas are developing. People are coming, building, bringing blocks and all things. They just let them come, let them come, let them, let them build up and then you engage. But before the good even comes, you are doing this, saying you must pay me before it lands. They will go elsewhere. And then we are left with our pride. Pride is not going to put food on the table. It's not. So it's for them to see it like that, as opposed to us just simply saying, stop that, stop that, don't do that. It's easy to say that. So you have to literally come down to their level and show them that this thing that they feel they are fighting for, they can be more efficient at it 
can still be welcoming for people who will bring investment to our land. So once again, that still comes down to the mind. Amazing. All right, uh, Your Majesty, uh, quickly, let's just talk a bit about tradition. And I uh, would please like you to share with us your thoughts on preserving uh, the originality of the Shekin tradition, which seems to be containing the modern times. And uh, also, if you can also address uh, the issue of preserving the language, which is almost going into extinction due to several reasons. Uh, for some people, both parents are not from Shekiri. For some people, there's this ethnocentrism kind of feeling when they feel, why should I speak the language or make me look like one village, you know, somebody. For some other person, modernization. So I feel English is the in thing to do. So let me just go ahead and just speak English. So all of these reasons and many more. You know, actually acting as a thing to preserving uh, our language. What are you going to do to address this? I say this with all seriousness. Since I, I was just talking about pride, mm -hmm. I will not even now, as I'm answering this, hide behind pride. I know I look, or I'm told that I look every inch a king. And yes, I'm an Ishakiri man, I'm proud. My father was a king, my grandfather was a king. But my one regret in this life, and I've been saying this for the last seven years, even before my father passed, is that me, the incoming king, I am not perfectly fluent in the language. That is my one regret in this life. It's embarrassing to admit, but I'm not too proud to admit it. And so there is a tendency for me to want to overcompensate for that, amplifying everything else that I can mm. that celebrates our tradition. When I was growing up, I can only speak for my household. And still I say this with heaviness, like many parents in Nigeria, wanted the best for their children and in their mind that looked like education first mm -hmm. and every opportunity that that education provides chase it chase it chase it it's a good thought unfortunately especially as an ethnic minority the language tends to suffer. This phenomenon is not Ishekiri. Even Bini people who are larger than us, which I know for a fact, they suffer it too. A lot of ethnic nationalities in the Niger Delta, they suffer it. I dare say, Fulani, I have not met one Fulani person. No matter how elite they are or how common they are, every Fulani person I have met speaks Fulani. 93% of every Hausa person I have met speaks Hausa. 75% of every Yoruba person I think I've met speaks Yoruba. The rest of it, it's diminishing. What is so special about Fulani that an Ishakiri man cannot match in terms of the Fulani culture and the Ishakiri culture? I cannot answer that. I know we are, as a people, we are proud of who we are. We are proud of our heritage. But our parents' generation, generally, not just the Shekiri, had, especially in southern Nigeria, you remember, Fulani, mm -hmm. Hausa, Yoruba. And I think Yorubas quickly realized that they had to even professionalize their language, study it in school, like we, they love book anyways. Their intelligentsia was funded and encouraged. And as you come away from Yoruba and you're coming towards the Niger Delta, I don't know, we have a tendency in the South to be pro-West. One of the things I'm proud of in this life is I don't have an English name, which a lot of Southern Nigerians do, and they are so happy to present their English name first. And I did not give my children English names. 
But these people will know that I have an appreciation for culture and tradition. They will know. I have been privileged to travel the world. And I say this with every seriousness. If I could come back again, not even necessarily as a prince, I'll come back as a black man. I'll come back as a Nigerian man. When we show up to the venue, I'm into arts, I'm into history. Everybody goes to the Louvre when I am talking to foreigners about where I come from. And they are always in awe. It never fails. They are in awe. So, now that I am in the driver's seat, I'm going to have to put my money where my mouth is and amplify the good that we have, which oftentimes we don't even know that we have. I was told um, during um, Gyeongme Kenwili's reign, I think it was his second coronation anniversary, the Sultan of Sokoto came, was it his second or his third? Yeah. And everybody thinks about the Sultan of Sokoto as, oh my goodness, he's the number one traditional ruler in Nigeria, you know, or when they see the Sultan, you know. And that was the first time his eminence was coming to worry. And he is somebody who has traveled this whole country. Every palace wants to demonstrate to his eminence that they are beautiful. Benin, Lagos, Ife, Oyo, Igala, everybody always wants to demonstrate to the Sultan that we are beautiful and we are worthy of being recognized. He was in awe with what he saw, our cultural display. He was, I heard what he said, he was in awe. And this is Ishekiri that has, we were just simply doing what we were born to do. Not what we have invested money to do. Not what we have been rehearsing every day, refining it as an art. It's just what we do. Oh, the Sultan is coming. They probably rehearse for like five days. That's how we go dance. That's how we they dance, you know? And he thought it was the most beautiful thing he ever saw. So imagine what he would have said if we had rehearsed for three months. I don't know if you've been to Broadway shows or seen a play. They don't just show up for five days and the Olu Akemboa play. They don't just rehearse for five days. Months! And then you are in awe of what you see. Imagine if we did that for all our dances. Yes, it sounds a bit silly. And we did dance since now, it's happy dance. Apply excellence to this thing, not just we know how to do it. And you will find that there is an economy there. You will find that there is wealth there. And that's all, that's all they do in Thailand rehearsing their royal dance and everybody comes from the whole world just to see them change the guard in the king of Thailand. Uh, that's what everybody goes to see guards, soldiers marching to change the guard in Buckingham Palace because they invested in that and they realize we have something here. People see soldiers all the time. You know, so I thank God for my exposure and a lot of my ideas that come naturally to me, you know, has to do with our culture and our identity. It may look foreign at first, as we try to fine tune them, as we try to apply them. And I won't be surprised, there may be some resistance, because ah, no, 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 not gonna change with him, you know. Mm. Try, try it. And I hope, I hope it will be well received. Thank you. And what you just said now is, uh, confidence that yes, it will be a new dawn even in the creative industry as well of the Shekiri uh, Kingdom. All right, um, moving on to still talking about uh, culture and uh, tradition as well. Uh, we have a rich tourism potential that you know it's untapped but ready to be, and we have about 400 years of rich cultural history, great opportunity you know that you will be having in the next uh, two months. I'm not mistaken, to be the 21st Ulua Wari. What plan do you have to create like a center of learning uh, to showcase the rich cultural heritage of the Shekiri people, something like a mini museum that people can come from time to time to learn about uh, the Shekiri culture and heritage and everything that concerns us as a people? I actually do have a plan. I'm not sure if I'll be able to share the details, 
but I actually started working on a palace museum with my father. Um, and then when he passed, everything just took a different direction, so we just left it. So picking that up, we have already started picking it up. So that is going to be something that you will see we hit the ground running. Um, there is a rebranding of our history, starting with our monarchy that is all but complete. And it will be unveiled on the coronation day. Um, something that I believe is unprecedented in Nigeria. There are designs to have a royal academy, which will not only be a source of learning and innovation, but I also expect it to be a source of serious employment, at least for those who are um, open to such a fashion, such a career, such a job, you know. It's going to be very messy at the beginning. And the only thing I can compare it to is uh, Emperor Constantine, where he called everybody together and said, look, we need to have one official account, one Bible as it were. Because before he called them in Nicaea, everybody had their own story. Everybody had their own version. And he called them together. It was messy. They were at it for a couple of years. A lot of people were shouting, arguing. People were killed. In our case, nobody would die. But it's almost like we're going to come up with an Ishakiri Bible. And that debate is going to include old people. It's going to include women. Women are going to have a voice. It's going to include young people. Because the truth is, we are the ones who are going to inherit this culture. And um, culture, I believe, is dynamic. If you camp and say, we are building on this, this is cannot be moved, it cannot be shaken. Well, there is a core that cannot be shaken, but there are parts around it that have to morph. So I believe this academy will bring and encourage that debate, that fusion, that interaction. Hopefully it also sparks off a sense of renaissance in our people, which I believe is needed, which I believe is due, it's right. All right, let's talk about healthcare. Um, report has it that fake drugs is number one leading cause of death from preventable diseases. And uh, you know this is only possible because of where uh, we don't have enough primary healthcare or places where we don't have primary healthcare. Now let's come to the you know the Shakiri communities. In some communities we have primary healthcare, and in some we don't have primary healthcare. Now in those we have primary healthcare, the healthcare system is almost not functional. So what are your thoughts on the healthcare system generally, with specific consideration to primary healthcare in the kingdom? specifically again to those in the villages who do not have this access into the normal healthcare system. We know the slogan health is wealth. Once again, it's easy to say that. After a while, it's almost like it doesn't mean anything. It's just words. If you build, even if it's one bungalow in every community, healthcare center, do we have enough people, healthcare professionals to staff it? Are they ready to leave the town and go and live in those places? Not they are there from Monday to Thursday evening and they leave three day weekend to go back to town. Um, so that is first of all, do we have the funds to build and spread? And once it is there, do we have enough dedicated staff to be in those places? It's not attractive right now to go and live in the riverine community taking care of a 
a big village, a small town. It's not easy. You must have love and commitment for those people. And a lot of people who have been trained to be nurses and doctors, how are you going to convince them to move out there? Is there electricity for them? Is there a social life for them? Even if they go, are they going to carry their families there? Probably not. Which means they're going to be away a lot. So I don't want to get into the trap of something like pool resources together and we'll build, even if it's just one small bungalow. Fine, even if we're able to pull those resources and build it. Who is staffing it? And are they going to be available all the time? Not the one that you'll be waiting to call him out. The man has to come from Tapele. You are waiting. God forbid something happens because the person was not on the ground. And I wonder, you know, what really happened to the knowledge our grandparents had as to the traditional ways of healing and healthcare. Yes, it wasn't great, but it's almost like that has even died. And the Western medicine people so crave, the infrastructure is not available. So it's almost like the people are just there in limbo. They can't turn to traditional medicine. And Western medicine, unfortunately, is evasive. So in answering that, I know I have not exactly given an answer. Healthcare, especially in the riverine areas, like education, building of schools, and even getting people to relocate back there just to live. We have to... I think it comes down to good leadership. Organize ourselves. Clear the land. And encourage people that it is safe to go back and live there. But for a lot of people to go back and live there, especially young people, there has to be some semblance of electricity. Mm. water so if you there isn't first of all portable water in the community some people can thug it out and do without electricity so if there's no water there's no electricity forget access road i believe if there's electricity and there's water that can attract people the road will come some say it's the reverse build the road first you are encourage people to come because that's actually a Chinese proverb. And some will actually agree with that. Because when there's a road and people can move, so if you are farming, you can bring your stuff to the road. If you are trying to get somewhere that there's access, a lot of things will come on that road. So in our case, if it is to dredge our canals and make it motorable, navigable, as opposed to building a literal road, transportation, I suppose, is the thing. If you create a highway, more than likely poverty will end. I think that's what the Chinese are trying to say. So before we even talk of healthcare, if we want to talk about healthcare, what is bringing the healthcare? So you have to lay foundations first before. That's how I see it. Amazing. Alright, um, let's talk about uh, something that is really, really of concern now. There's this presumption about the Shakira identity and that has translated into marginalization of fellow Shakiri within you know, the ethnic group, specifically against those who do not have one parent as a Shakiri. So there's this conflict of identity about who is more a Shakiri you know, than the other person. It's also saying that those who are not fluent in the language, and we already talked about that uh, earlier, versus those who are fluent in the language, that this has further polarized us than unite us. Your Majesty, I would like to ask, please, how do you intend to draw attention to this challenge in a way that fosters inclusion and also possibly drive this message of oneness of which we have always, uh, before now, flung under? Once again, this is in-house, mm. at least for now, before it goes viral. I am also a very famous victim of this. Every Shaki person knows my mother is a Yoruba lady. Okay. So at the high political level, all what you are saying is still grassroots level. I have suffered this. Both parents are not a Shakiri. It is mistakenly assumed that, that you have both parents in Shakiri. 
number one, automatically you will speak the language. I actually know a few people who both parents are Shakiri. Mm. Grew up in this town. And they don't speak Shakiri. What's going on there? I think it's also the same thing of they want a better life for their children, so invest in their education and all that and all that. Even in our history, we have prominent Shaky people in our history who didn't have both parents in Shakiri. And they have done and contributed immensely to our pride, to our glory, to our identity, than even those who had Shakiri parents, both of them. It does not automatically follow that you have both Shakiri parents, that you are more Shakiri, or that you care more for Ishekiri, or that you even identify with Ishekiri pains and Ishekiri problems more than those who only have one Ishekiri period. It's not automatic. It's actually also similar to the way some people think that because they have suffered and they know what suffering is, when we get there, you encourage everybody have we not all suffered you know me i know you, you i know your pains and all that we grew up together when they get there more often than not because there is a deficit it's not just because you identify with the generality or your definition of what the generality is they get there and they are disappointment they get there and they betray they get there and they sell out mm. And you will find those who did not necessarily grow up and suffer and are so, oh, we are all the same identity, but their minds and their hearts are pure and they are more willing to sacrifice, more willing to commit and see to development. But it's almost like you don't want to give them a chance because there is this Oh, we have been identified as fellow laborers, fellow sufferers. You mm. cannot know our pain. So don't come here and talk where our own is. Where we are small enough already as a people. So anyone who has even one parent in Shekiri or grandmother in Shekiri and they feel they have a heart for a Shekiri people, and they want to come and live, not to come and use Ishekiri platform. My grandmother is Ishekiri, so therefore from here I want to run for office. <laughs> if you only have one grandparent at Ishekiri, but that gives you a heart for Ishekiri, and you want to come and live among the people and demonstrate that, by all means, open your arms and accept these people. It's almost like being Ishekiri is a spiritual thing, not a, not a parental or a genealogical thing. You have a heart for the people, you have a heart for the people. There are people who have both Ishekiri parents, they don't have a heart for Ishekiri. Yes, they dress like it, they speak the language, but at the end of the day, they are so broken and bruised. They, it's almost like Ishekiri not a good food for my table. So it's really, it's really not, in my opinion, something to, it's not a hill to die on. It's not, in fact, if we go through our history and we remove people who don't have both a Shakiri parents, a lot of our light will dim. A lot of our light will dim. The famous uh, Olobo man, Ikai, mm. wasn't he supposed to be an Oibo man? And the Shakiris are so proud to call him there that they descend from him. If they had the attitude of he's a foreigner or he's half a Shakiri, you know, I mean, on the other hand, I would like to see more Shakiri uh, marriages. Shakiri marry Shakiri. Yeah. You know, I would love that. But that we want to see more of that doesn't mean that one is more pure than the other. In other words, you're saying that the definition of a true Shakiri is the one who has a Shakiri at heart. Yes. All right, one last question before I let you go, Your Majesty. Just quickly share with us your thoughts on the political structure. Uh, of the state right now with regards to our position as a minority group 
and how well do you think we are faring as a people uh, in comparison to how we were before in the days of uh, Kotiebo, some Christ and the others? Obviously, if you want to compare us to Kotiebo and Christ and others, we have gone very far off the map. I think the reason we are where we are today is greed. We have a lot of usurpers. A lot of usurpers who stand on the Shekiri platform. Not only political leaders, even our leaders in society, in the community, they stand on the platform and say, I am representing my community, my people. And let's call a spade a spade. It's not even, they are not even, the resources they are siphoning, they are not even putting it in our land. It's going to Abuja, it's going to Lagos, it's going to Houston, it's going to London, it's going to Dubai. If we really had an identity, a concept of what it really is to be Shekiri, not just simply, I was born here and I saw the cloth. Look at me, beautiful attire. You know, nobody tie cloth past a Shekiri man. You don't have to tie a pie. If all you wear is French suits, but you are chasing the common good of Ishekiri. Look, you don't even have to be making speeches. Nobody has, nobody has to see your face, nobody has to know your name. If we are able to unite and stand and say, this is how we want things to be done, and it is possible, if Ishekiri comes together today and says, look, let us actually come up with an Ishekiri plan. Not a Koko plan, or an Omadino plan, Jackpot plan. Because a lot of people go to hijack, you soap at those levels, nothing comes out of it. But we at least we give this a try. They say, okay, let's come together for the next 10 years. Let us have an experiment. Shaky people, let's experiment something. Starting on the 1st of January 2022, and it will end on the 31st of December 2031. Yes, let us sign paper that we are going to draw a 10-year plan for a security that we will start implementing immediately. So everywhere where we can draw funds for a security, the famously controversial IRDC, yeah? And we say, look, everybody, calm down. Let's draw funds from here. And we're bringing it to a table that everybody is seeing. And this is how we want to do things for Ishekiri. We want to dredge these canals. We want to designate this place as a solid land and clear it and do oil palm plantation here and there and come up with ways as to how it puts money into an Ishekiri purse, an Ishekiri sovereign wealth fund or something like that. For 10 years, you will be amazed. Because guess what? When even banks there are people in this country who have money and they want to invest in something serious. When they see, wait, what are these people? They see a small unit acting with purpose. They will come and say, I want to invest in this. I'm not going to be waiting on Desopa Deck, NDDC, Federal Government, Ministry of Transport to come and do what? Everybody's always waiting for government. Even them in Abuja, them to are waiting for money to chop before it's going to get to you. So all that waiting on government, if it comes, it comes. Great. But we need to come together and decide, let us use our own. And let's stop being political. Stop, oh, I know the governor, he will put me in this place. I know the chairman, he will put me in this place. You have gone against the grain of what we are trying to build. But everybody wants to be their own. Build their own chiefdom and fiefdom and dukedom inside this kingdom. And what does that mean? As small as we are, we're going to be a thousand into a thousand pieces. And then we'll be crying. And we love to sing one language, one king, one people. How is that working for us? Are we one in heart? You know the answer to that question. Indeed, his people can confidently say 
they are in safe hands. From the production crew of Carex Media and Social Ed Magazine, I am Precious Waini Ogolaja. Thank you for watching. Hey, I'm